The focus on Rosa Parks' respectability, on the ways that people united behind the moral upstanding and the ACP worker and seamstress rather than a younger and poorer Claudette Colvin, has unconsciously, I would argue, made it easy not to see Rosa Parks' core radicalism and thus miss her activism in these later decades. Key to the success of the bus boycott in the midst of the Cold War had been obscuring Rosa Parks' actual political history. The construction of her respectability, of her being a good Christian woman and a tired seamstress, was pivotal to the success of the boycott because it helped deflect Cold War suspicions of this grassroots militancy. Immediately after Rosa Parks' arrest, rumors quickly arose within white segregationist circles that Parks was a communist plant, was an NAACP plant, but most of these people did not actually seem to know of Parks' work with the NAACP, with the Highlander Folk School. And so strategically, the success of Parks as a symbol of the boycott turned on activists like King, like the Black Press, and like Parks herself, obscuring her longstanding history and larger radicalism. Rosa Parks' long history of activism then would become a secret to keep the movement safe, and she and others would dissemble by calling her a simple seamstress. The paradox was this. Key to her decision to remain seated on the bus and to community outrage that erupted after her arrest was Rosa Parks' long history of political involvement. As Parks herself put it, the people of the community knew me and respected her longstanding commitment to racial justice and political work. They also knew that she would not flinch under the tremendous pressure right, that would come upon anyone who dares to sort of take on this role. However, this very same political history which enabled people to identify with her then was backgrounded to protect the boycott itself and that veil would last a lifetime. People have thus assumed that there was not a story to tell about her activities in these later years, and Rosa Parks was not one to disrupt that assumption. She did not tend to volunteer any information that people had not directly asked for. And interviewers almost never asked, preferring to talk about Montgomery and to return over and over to that evening on the bus, even as they sat with her in Detroit, right, decades later. Right? So they'd be sitting with her in Detroit, and they'd say, Mrs. Parks, what do you think about Montgomery today? And here she is in Detroit. She's been in Detroit since 1957, and it's still Montgomery, Montgomery, Montgomery. Congressman John Conyers, who Rosa Parks worked for for more than two decades, has attributed the omission of Parks' radicalism in part to the discongruity of it. She had a heavy pro progressive speak, he, he argued, that was uncharacteristic for a neat, religious, demure, church-going lady. Indeed, standard notions of black power leave little room for the quiet militant. In the popular imagination, black militants are men. They do not speak softly. They do not go to church. They do not dress conservatively. They do not get nervous. They are not tender about people's suffering. They do not work behind the scenes. And yet, many, many militants were exactly that. Generous and patient in her assessment of people, that did not mean that Rosa Parks was not angry at the depth of injustice and the extent of white resistance and white obfuscation to the civil rights movement. <laughs>